things. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'm glad that people can't view that introduction. It's always embarrassing. But anyway, thank you so much for having me. Thank you to you and uh, you know IWMI team. Uh, I'm really delighted, and I think you know normally I have done a lot of presentations to people who are deeply embedded in this you know coal and uh, transitions and energy transition so it's a bigger challenge for me to actually simplify some of these larger processes that's happening in the field of you know moving away from coal and why it's difficult and what are some of the solutions um, so i'll try to do a you know as as decent job as possible uh, so with that, I think I'll just go ahead and share my slides. Uh, since I think we have a smaller crowd, I, I would suggest that as I'm presenting, if you have a burning question, you know, feel free to ask. And you can also ask, obviously, in the end. But I think it, if you really have something that is not clear or it's a burning question, do, do go ahead and ask. I don't mind at all. Okay, so I think... You know, the topic that I chose today is focusing on understanding coal transitions in a country like India, where in a big country, populous, uh, urbanizing country like India. And what are the challenges? Why it's so hard for a country like India to move away from foss a fossil fuel like coal? Uh, and that's the right way to do both from a climate point of view, but also from a local environment point of view. And what's the way forward? So what I thought I would do today is kind of, you know, break it down into some buckets of issues. So first I will focus on what I'm labeling as techno-economic issues. So why, why it's hard for India to move away from coal, from a technology and economics point of view, and what are some solutions? What are some things that governments and companies can do in the short and medium term? I'm, when I say short and medium term, I'm really talking about 10, 15 years. Um, then I will touch upon some socioeconomic issues, um, you know, of coal transition in, in, in the Indian context. That is something that I focused on in my PhD, and that is something I will continue, I am continuing to work on. So I have a bit more depth on that, and, you know, uh, I will be able to focus more deeply on that. So within that, I will kind of, provide a context of what's happening globally, then look at, you know, transition planning in India currently, uh, the field and the policy process has really evolved in the last three, four years. No policymaker in India had ever heard about just transition three or four years ago, but, you know, the landscape of that has completely changed in the last three years. And then it's very important, at least for this issue, uh, for this issue, uh, it's very important to think about how to finance a just energy transition in India. And finally, just I'll provide some large big picture frameworks um, to think about how to plan for a just transition in India. So, you know, why we are thinking about, it's obvious, I think, for this crowd, why we are thinking about moving away from coal. I think it's you know, more and more scientific reports and IPCC reports are showing that, you know, to meet any global, uh, to meet Paris climate targets or of two degrees or keeping temperatures below 1.5 degree, I think all fossil fuels, particularly coal, needs to decline rapidly. Um, and in that context, India being the second largest producer and consumer of coal, um, you know, India will have to pay, play its part if there is any uh, possibility for world to meet its target, because if India follows a coal and a fossil fuel pathway, I think that will make it very difficult. And I'm saying this with full recognition of the concept of common but differentiated responsibility. You know, that is a reality. You know, carbon budgets around the world have been taken up by global north countries, uh, but that doesn't absolve a country like India to not take actions and India has been taking action. So that's the context in which this talk is happening. Oops. Okay, so let's kind of start to focus on some techno economic issues, you know, technology and economics issues of why it's difficult to move away from coal. 
before that, I just want to mention briefly, probably you guys know this, but if you don't, like in India, the entire coal sector is primarily dominated by state-owned companies. So mining, almost 96, 97% of coal today in India is produced by state-owned companies like Coal India, Shingreni Coal Company, and Naveli Lignite. The bulk of the coal, almost 50, 60% of the coal is transported by Indian railways, again, owned by government of India. Um, most of, half of the coal power plants, uh, 45, 50% of the coal plants are owned by state-owned companies. Uh, and a lot of this coal asset funding has been done by state-owned banks like State Bank and other central PSUs, uh, PSU banks. So this is this is barring you know coal production. Um, I think a bulk of this is actually owned and ra run by state-owned companies. So it's the role of private sector, although increasing significantly, in in terms of like doing more subcontracting work, and in the, especially in the power sector, the the role of state-owned enterprises is huge in this, and that is an advantage and a disadvantage. And I will talk about that in my subsequent slides so what's happening globally is that in the oecd countries whether it's europe or us coal is declining coal capacity is declining it's a serious decline in the last 10 15 years but interestingly not a bulk of this capacity decline is being replaced by gas it's not replaced by re renewables although renewables are a part of the story but the key story whether you look at us whether you look at you know, other parts of Europe, most of the coal capacity is replaced by domestic gas and in some context, you know, by import, gas imports, whether it's uh, in the case of Europe. Um, their energy demand is flat or actually declining. So whatever coal capacity is getting closed, you know, it's, you're kind of doing one-on-one -on -one replacement by gas or renewables. But when you come to India, you know, the coal capacity is increasing. Actually, most of the coal capacity was built very recently and and that capacity is slowly increased i mean it was it increased rapidly in the last decade but you know in the last few years uh, the capacity increase is declining um, renewables are of course you know a big story in india it, india used to have very very few gigawatts of installed capacity in 2009-10 but the 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 rise has been exponential the rise has been significant, not exponential, but significant uh, in the Indian context. But the problem with India is that India doesn't have domestic gas. It's anyway so much dependent on oil and imported coal also. Even though India produces so much coal, it also imports a, a lot of coal. India doesn't have domestic, easily accessible domestic gas for its power plants to make that switch that OECD countries have done. And on top of that, India's energy demand is growing unlike other OECD countries. So that makes that, this is the core of why it's hard for India to sign on to like a coal phase out, you know, timeline. Because in the because of lack of alternate sources, growing energy demand, and like uh, the point two that I'm making that is uh, India's coal fleet is quite young. It's almost built in the last 10, 15 years. The average age of you know of the 210 gigawatts of coal capacity installed in India is 13 years old. It's it's you know it's very young, and when you compare that to OECD countries, it's almost 41 years old. They should have shut down anyway long time ago. So even from that context, this transition is not you know like they, they may be shutting down like one or two or three years early, but they're not like doing this significant transition as is always talked about. And so in the short term, the strategy of government of India and you know of many people who work in the field is very, very clear that India needs both coal and renewables. Uh, in the long run, I, and one of the issues with renewables or many that renewables are currently facing many challenges from DISCOM issues, which you know we can talk about, but DISCOM is the core of why you know, one of the reasons why renewables is not able to expand the way it can expand. Mobilization of finance, most of the renewable projects, if you look at it today, are financed by domestic sources. Very little of international finance has come. 
this means so many policy flip-flops sometimes import duty on solar panels and imports sometimes those import duties are you know uh, you're taken away and so there's so there's uncertainty in policy it keeps on changing some state governments uh, they renegotiate contracts like Andhra Pradesh and, and stuff like that and that creates a lot of like policy uncertainty and in, and India is so dependent on China for import dependency on panels and last but not least renewables although you know to reach the scale that it is about 150 160 gigawatt from you know about three or four gigawatts in 2009 10 uh, it India has used up all or most of the land that was easily available to install these solar panels and I'm not talking about rooftop and all of course that that has hum tremendous potential but when you're talking about utility scale solar projects especially uh, land is going to be a major challenge given the scales of installation that India needs to do. So these these are reasons why overall what the strategy currently of the thinking of the policymakers in India is, you know, expand coal or slowly expand coal and, you know, really embrace renewables. But India is not really ready to sign on to, you know, a complete phase out deal and that as you know was a major topic in the last cop so what research and actually in many state governments or if government of india some arms of government of india's thinking is that india could potentially stop building new coal plants you know barring those 30 20 30 gigawatts that are at advanced stages of construction i think it's it's difficult financially uh, to stop those power plants right now. India could also shut down. There's been many analyses that show that although that 20, 30 gigawatts of new coal plant capacity would need to come uh, to pipeline, you know, would, those in the pipeline would need to come online. India could actually shut down old and efficient power plants. There's many of them about again, 20, 30 gigawatts. So it will be like a almost a replacement of the new uh, capacity that will come on and there's so many different research organizations that have done this analysis and come to almost the same conclusion that india can shut down you know some there's a range but shut down something between 30 to 40 gigawatts of uh, um, you know there's a huge issue of discoms health and that primarily stems from the subsidy regime you know discoms are become political tool and they are told to subsidize from agriculture to everything else and and it's just it's just a vicious cycle of um, discoms then won't pay because their financial health is not in good condition they will not pay to renewable companies therefore this cycle keeps on continuing sometimes government gives some money to them but we have to find a way to manage the discoms financial health and that's very important for for the long term growth of renewables so to just to give you context uh, cw had done an analysis showing that if india has to re reach net zero by 2070 it has to increase solar alone from something like you know almost 60 70 80 gigawatts that currently india has to 5000 gigawatts so it's a huge undertaking you know the, there is momentum but to achieve that kind of scale uh, lots of work lots of policy coherence needs to happen and investments in storage technologies is i think also the elephant in the room because it's it's a cliche at this point but sun doesn't shine and all the time and wind doesn't blow but storage can change that game it's still not there yet from a cost point of view uh, but, you know, there is hope that in the next decade or so, some of these technologies will mature enough and uh, therefore be able to provide, you know, 24-7 power. So that's just very broad, basic, some technical economic solutions to how to manage, how to make the coal sector cleaner, efficient in the short term, because it's hard, it's hard for a country like India to transition away from coal in the next 10 15 years but this is something that india can do this would lead to peaking of coal you know um, and that that should be india's target peaking of coal rather than phasing out of coal um, because that's how this is all embedded so now now that we covered like some of the big picture techno economic issues 
I will now focus on some socioeconomic issues and challenges. And as I said, this is something I have been focusing more on in the last two, three years, uh, in the last few years, sorry. Uh, and, and so I will go into a bit more depth into this. So for those who are not familiar with just transition, sometimes also referred to as just energy transition, what we're really talking about is as countries or as country like India, move up, moves away from fossil fuels like coal to renewables, what happens to the future of workers, their communities, dependent regions. And so this just transition has become a really important way of thinking about what the future of those workers and communities could look like. This is a topic that has gained global importance. Um, you know, it, 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 although this concept has had existed from 1970s and 1980s, it originated from labor movement in the US in 1970s. Um, but this topic has really you know, taken off in the last four or five, six years. Um, and a lot of people think about it from a point of view of justice. You know, these workers have provided the fuel that have run our economies, that has mo helped modernize parts of the world, if not every part of the world. Um, so it's important to make sure that these workers and communities don't suffer as a result of transition. But the other, you know, very blunt way of uh, thinking about why people care about just transition is it's also a very much a political economy question, right? You have so many regions in many countries that are so dependent on these fossil fuel resources. So if you really want to further energy transition, you actually need support of states and regions. Um, and, and therefore, just transition is an articulation of showing a new future to people who are currently dependent on uh, you know, fossil fuels. So that's very basic of what globally people are thinking about just transition. But actually, beyond theory, there's a lot happening in this space. Um, Many governments, as I said, like so many in so many countries, coal is in decline. US, be it Canada, Germany, and South Africa is one of the non OECD countries, which where the decline has not started, but their plants are also very old, their mines are old, and so they are also actively formulating just transition policies. There's tremendous amount of funding available in this field. Um, you know, governments have set aside, Europe has set aside $40 billion. US has identified something like 40, 38, 39 US dollars uh, to help coal communities. Um, South Africa has created a presidential task force uh, to think about, you know, retraining and uh, diversification strategies, et cetera, et cetera. So lots happening in this place globally. Even coal companies, coal power companies like ESCOM, which is you know, South Africa's monopoly utility recently formed, uh, not recently, actually two, three years now, uh, have uh, three years back have found what is called the Just Energy Transition Offices uh, to assess, you know, finance options for repurposing its coal stations. So they want to repurpose uh, coal stations to renewable energy and in the process create jobs for workers and communities who will lose out as, as a result of closure of these coal plants. So, from governments to companies, lots happening in this space, actually. In fact, there are places and, you know, countries and subnational states that have actually created just transition laws. So Germany has something called Structural Support for Coal Regions Act. Uh, USA, Colorado, uh, it's, it's, it's a kind of a model act. It's called the Just Transition for Coal-Based Electrical Energy Economy Act. A lot of US states are now copying this Colorado's act and modifying according to um, you know, their needs. So it's actually embedded in the legislation in many, many jurisdictions. Um, broadly, what these laws and policies do broadly is they focus on workers, they focus on skill development of workers who will lose jobs. They focus on things like pension support, providing new job opportunities. And then there's a whole category of community support, you know, for diversification of local economy to other non fossil fuel sectors, uh, remediation of coal mines and coal power plants, 
is another area. So, I mean, broadly, that's what all these laws and policies globally focus on. And what is what you will hear more and more, and it's happening more and more, is what is called just energy transition partnerships. Um, la, at last COP, at COP26, South Africa and, uh, you know, coal dependent South Africa and donor countries like uh, Germany, other parts of your other countries in Europe, US, um, and I think Canada as well, formed what is called a just energy transition partnership, where these rich countries uh, committed to almost $8.5 billion to help kickstart South Africa's transition away from coal. Now, that's another thing that almost one year down the line, that money has not been realized. So that's not a very big surprise given this, uh, the, all, all the previous climate finance commitments and the realization that we have seen in other contexts. But nonetheless, this is something that is growing. Now the G7 countries are very keen to have such partnerships with India, Indonesia, Vietnam, Senegal, etc. Um, and so, so this is also a topic where, you know, multilaterally, uh, quite a bit of work is happening. And I have to tell you that all of this has started in the last five or six, seven years. It's a very, very new field in the context of coal transition and climate change. Uh, before this, this, this just didn't exist. I mean, just transition as a concept existed for any closure, but this is very new in the climate space. It started with Paris and then subsequently it's gaining momentum uh, over time. So that's fine. All of this is happening at a global scale. It's all good, but what does it mean in Indian context? And, and as I said, like currently India is expanding coal and will expand coal for the, for the, at least for a decade. So why is just transition planning important today? Like, why are we talking about it today? Like it's 10 years from today. And of course, why it's important in the long-term future. So why it's important today is simple. Even though overall the coal production and coal capacity expansion, the coal production numbers and coal capacity is expanding, there's lots of coal mines, lots of power plants are closing at a regional scale. Uh, almost 293 mines in the last three years have been closed, abandoned, or discontinued um, in India, according to Ministry of Coal itself. And you have some places, for example, Ramgarh district, where all the mines, very coal dependent district in Jharkhand, Ramgarh, where all the coal mines will close by 2030. So we don't have a lot of time if you're a Ramgarh citizen. Uh, if you're a Ramgarh resident, you don't have a lot of time to think about transitioning the whole district economy. You have only a decade. Um, according to West Bengal government's own assessment, most of the mines, almost 93% of the mines in West Bengal, coal mines will close by 2030. Only large few in a very big efficient mines will remain and most others will go. So while overall there is an expansion, regionally it's closing. So it's quite important that India thinks about managing these districts and states like West Bengal, uh, because if India does it well now, it will help in the bigger transition that is coming. So as we know that India has signed on to a net zero by 2070, so that's only 50 years ago, uh, 50 years to go. It's not, it's not like, you know, we have hundreds of years. And to really ramp down the fossil fuel dependence, uh, not just coal, but all fossil fuels in these 50 years is a huge undertaking. And that will have implications on so many workers, millions of workers, at least in seven states, when you think about coal, over 50 districts, you know, the whole economy of some of these districts are dependent on coal. You have coal power plants, you have coal mines, you have steel that is coal dependent, you know, you have cement, all of this is like coal is kind of like an anchor economy in many of these districts. So it's very important to plan for this in the long run. And we have seen that those countries that have not planned, uh, you know, in the long term and have taken knee jerk reactions, they, the just transition policies have not worked because you have to build consensus, you have to deal with humans, you have to, you know, de build that social capital, you have to build capacity. So it's a huge undertaking in the long run. But 
and why it's a huge undertaking and this is some of this i'm drawing for my from my phd work is that when we think about you know this just transition a lot of people only think about jobs right people will be impacted and 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 that is true and that is at the center of it but when you think about so i i've created these three boxes so when you think about the leftmost box coal is actually the most important source of revenue for Indian railways. In fact, uh, the railways overcharges uh, coal transportation and they subsidize the passenger segment. In the last four years, there have been no railway hikes because they are hiking coal, you know, coal, coal freight. And that's exactly what they subsidize the passenger segment. Such is the dependency that it's a very major undertaking if coal declines in the long run. Um, Almost three percent of central government revenues comes from all kinds of different coal taxes. State governments, about six, seven state governments, uh, you know, really depend on coal revenue. Something between five to fifteen percent, depending on the state. And these states are actually already very poor, like from Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, Odisha, uh, West Bengal, uh, Madhya Pradesh, Telangana, etc. So it's a very major uh, undertaking. And CSR spending is also a major thing. I mean, when all these coal companies, state-owned, st central government PSUs are highly profitable, so they end up spending a lot of money in CSR. And I will provide some numbers, but I'm just giving you kind of the buckets in which you have to think about the dependencies. There are direct jobs, you know, there's indirect jobs in supply chain, there's induced jobs from Chaiwala to everybody who kind of depends on the spending. Uh, there's informal jobs. Uh, which are in large numbers in old coal mining regions of Jharkhand and West Bengal in particular, uh, where people are just scavenging coal, using it in their households and all. And there's about, you know, a large number of pensioners as well. And then the last bucket is the, you know, people use, a lot of people use coal as a cooking fuel. It's an industrial fuel from steel, cement, and coal companies develop like mixed use infrastructure. They make roads and stuff for themselves, which are also used by public. So just to give you a flavor of what are some of the things that one has to think about when you think about just transition planning, it's not, it's, it's not just about jobs. That's what I want to emphasize here. So some uh, based on lots of right to information applications, I gathered a lot of data um, and only direct and indirect jobs, I calculate that there are about 38 lakh uh, direct and indirect jobs. Again, this does not include induced jobs. This does not include large number of, I think that number is itself in like multiple, like tens of lakhs, uh, uh, the informal sector. Coal pensioners of about five, six lakhs stated to become almost 1 million, 10 lakh in, in the next five, seven years as many, many people are, many workers are retiring, that will be almost 1 million. Uh, in the year 2019, 2020, coal companies collectively spent about 14,000 uh, crores, uh, you know, and the, of course there's inefficiency in the system, but you know, it is also a reality based on my field work and of many other people that they contribute to school, houses, you know, healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. And then there is DMF collection of about uh, 3,005 crores. So overall, when you think about coal and the coal economy, you know, there's, it, it, it has a spillover effect on 284 districts. Of course, some of the districts, it's very minimal, but there are almost 50 districts where it's, it's a significant part of the local economy. So there are 43 districts which where I see that there are about you know over 10,000 direct and indirect jobs. Again, emphasizing this does not include induced and informal. If you include that, these numbers will be much, much, much higher. So what's happening at the policy level in India? And all of what all of these have only started in the last three or four years, I would say. Like before that, I I don't think there was even one research from India on this topic. So Ministry of Coal recently has formed a just transition division. You know, they it's it's really positive that even though coal transition is not happening, they are thinking about just transition. At least even though their lens is to think about how do you actually repurpose coal assets. 
But nonetheless, they have started a just transition division. They're working with the World Bank. Lots of research have been produced in the last three, four years. More and more evidence are coming. Jharkhand government, uh, we are working very closely with Jharkhand government. They're creating a task force on just transition. Uh, only even the chief minister has signed. It's just pending kind of like the final cabinet approval. Um, West Bengal government has also floated terms of reference for just transition studies for they're closing three or four coal mines and power plants. So how do you actually what what is the coal ecosystem when you close? What is the coal ecosystem that will be impacted when you close these coal mines? So some work is happening in West Bengal and most positively and most recently, this is a one month back phenomena that coal India and its eight subsidiaries have formed just transition committees to think more strategically about how to how to enable a just transition and that has also been very positive um, uh, in this space so just finally i will conclude with like a few slides of how to plan for a just transition in india um, so one thing as i said i will quickly run the slide but when you think about a district level you have to think about various categories of jobs various categories of revenues you know the csr spending the welfare funds and fuel like if if you shut down coal what would be the replacement fuel like would it be hydrogen would it be something completely different so it's very important to think in a holistic manner um, and this is what would be required uh, to to just to show the scale of money that would be required so coal india alone contributes something like 8 billion us dollars on taxes and royalties Pension obligations are currently at almost two, two and a half billion. And CSR spending is about 1.5. So if you add all the just three, these three elements, we're really talking about 80,000 crores every year. If you just want to do one-to-one -one replacement, but we are actually wanting to do something better, not one-to-one -one replacement. And, and again, this is just, you know, just to throw some numbers of what scale we are talking about. Of course, it's much more complicated. It depends on what policy you, you know, you kind of like, what, what is your policy pathway? You may not need this much money, but this is just to show you the scale of things here. So what currently I think my recommendation is that India needs a national policy framework, policies and laws on just transition. So, so the central government has to set the agenda on like, what is the direction of just transition and based on that some state implementation plans need to be created it's interesting that states are actually west bengal and jharkhand states are actually working towards their implementation plans but there's nothing happening at the national level coal industry is also thinking about implementation again these are early days but it's happening but there's no national framework and then i just listed a few interventions you know States need to think about diversification, convergence of various funds that they have at the district level or the state level for skill retraining, job creation, infrastructure development. And coal industry, I think companies like Coal India, if they invest in greener sectors in these states, unfortunately, even Coal India is trying to, a lot of their investments are currently happening in our Western and Southern states not whether you know the coal mines are which is in the eastern central state so that if coal industry invests in these states that is also a channel for job creation repurposing coal assets is a big big element of just transition planning and of course coal india can use its the might of its csr funds for skill training and stuff so i think this is a national framework is required and then states and coal industry can feed into that framework. Okay, so just once that national framework is there, as part of that framework, what is required as step one is, what is the amount of money and time required for India's just transition implementation needs? So like, if you want to do repurposing of coal assets as they close, you know, in this decade and then the next decade, how much money is required and what kind of you know policy would be required is very important so that kind of assessment needs to be in the national framework um, then india can 
definitely leverage a lot of domestic sources for finance. This private capital, institutional investors, actually globally, this is a big topic. And so both capital markets and institutional investors, large institutional investors have committed to just transition. And so I think domestically also this can happen. So investments can, they can encourage investments for support skill training, for example. And finance by governments, of course, through various consolidation of funds, public finance is important. And I also think regulators like RBI can play a role here. You know, come they can they can provide funds or they can encourage priority lending in coal districts, uh, for especially if it caters to just transition needs. So, so some of these, you know, things can be encouraged in India. And finally, you know, th there is a lot of international finance, at least declarations. We have to see if some of those funds actually realize in the long term. But like, like I mentioned, there's the Just Energy Transition Partnership with G7 countries. I think that's a very, very solid, uh, you know, partnership that is building up. India can do its bit. India can do research on what kind of projects it would like to be funded, and that would that's that's a potential source of fund. Uh, lots of multi, uh, you know, banks um, and climate investment funds have what is called the accelerated coal transition investment program. It's it's new and upcoming. We, we don't know what kind of funding they'll provide, but the goal is to provide concessional finance for reclaiming coal assets. And finally, you know, globally we have seen that philanthropy has played a very big role when it comes to just transition. There's something called the Just Transition Fund in US. It's so fascinating that they actually went to Bangladesh to learn the microfinance model, came back, created a Just Transition Fund, and then they provide seed money to entrepreneurs in coal counties, in coal in counties where coal asset coal is closing. And so there's very interesting models where philanthropy has participated. Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet run by Rockefeller and other foundations. They have also funded what in South Africa, along with ESCOM, they have funded a very interesting resource uh, and skill development center next to where the power plants are closing. So all this to say that philanthropy has a role in this. So I think if I have to summarize the field, you know, I would just say that in India, the momentum on just transition is building, uh, but it's still very early days. India needs a national framework. India needs to think more holistically uh, about this topic. Uh, there's a lot more work need that needs to be done. Thank you. And I'm happy to take questions now. And I will stop sharing Thank my you. slide so we can see. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Sandeep, so much. That was a fascinating uh, presentation and I, I learned a whole lot of new things. We do hear a lot about just energy transition, but I think you helped us uh, understand the landscape a bit better and what all is involved uh, for India to start uh, that journey. And also for me, particularly interesting was that the state governments and the coal India are already doing things in, in that direction. So that also comes as a, as a bit of a pleasant surprise. Um, I would now request uh, questions. I can see that Balshed has a question. Balshed, would you like to come on and ask your question? Balshed, by the way, was our speaker in the previous. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Balshed and I are from the same department at UBC. <laughs> so, okay, I see. Hi, Balshed. Yes. Hey, Sandeep. Um, Hi. Yeah, great talk. Thank you for that. Um, this is probably a very um this is a very new topic for me so the, maybe this question um has already been looked at but is there some idea on how many jobs are created per unit electricity produced by conventional versus renewables for example so if all of all the electricity yeah. is produced using renewables do, is there a chance that people currently working in coal mines can get alternative jobs yeah, there's actually lots of people. I mean, all the modelers of the world, when they work on just transition, they just do this. So there's there's all sorts of studies in this. Uh, the the big challenge 
with all of this i don't ask me the numbers of the, i have not looked at the numbers in a year uh, but i can send you some studies uh, lots of studies actually one of the challenges of all of this is that all the data is from three or four countries and then they extrapolate for the rest of the world um, and that that is the big challenge of this in fact one of my PhD chapters, we also collected this data. We didn't do uh, generation. Uh, we we had estimates for jobs for jobs per, per gigawatt for all energy technologies. And then we did modeling using an integrated assessment model to do these predictions. But again, like I said, the data is a big problem. It's it's outdated. It's you know it's it comes from a few countries. Although in my PhD, we did add a lot of data from India and a few other like non OECD uh, countries, but still data is a big issue, but there's lots of studies. And by and large, what these all these studies say that there will be more jobs in renewables, um, which makes sense, you know, I mean, given the scales of installations that is required, there will be actually a lot more jobs. And again, with the caveat that all these jobs compare direct jobs only. There is no way to estimate, you know, the whole informal economy or the whole like induced economy. Most of these at best focus on direct and indirect jobs. And there most studies, you know, from very green estimates to people who work in the fossil fuel, like I think the conclusion is that there will be more jobs in renewables if we hit all the targets. But the challenge is that the quality of jobs, right? Some of these are construction jobs that last from five days to 20 days, you know, perhaps. So you, it's not always an apples to apples, com, com, you know, comparison, because when you're talking about coal jobs in a country like India or even South Africa, you know, it's all state owned companies, you know, it's pensionable full time jobs. You can't really compare that with somebody who's building solar panels. So it's Although it's clear there will be more jobs, it's not clear if the number, you know, that uh, that can have one-on-one -on -one replacement. Uh, just want to add one last thing. Uh, don't want to drag this question, but the spatial geography of where renewables are growing in most countries is not where coal is declining. Uh, uh -huh. It's uh -huh. interesting. Uh -huh. if, if you look at India, uh, uh -huh. and I can take any country, there may be some exceptions, but if you think about India, where will coal decline? Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh of the world. Where is renewables growing? Rajasthan, Gujarat, etc. Right. So it's it's anyway a very different geography. So these new jobs, if we follow the same trajectory, will be for very different. Same is the case with U.S. Declines are in West Virginia, Kentucky, etc. But the gain is in California, Texas. So it's it's a very different. China has the same story. It's a very very different. Story. So I think I have come to the conclusion that while renewable or clean energy jobs in general can contribute, I think it will be a smaller uh, portion and you really need like a cluster of industries or something that people are now talking a lot about hydrogen, but I will see there's less studies to prove that uh, it can actually happen. Sorry, that was a long Thank answer. You. No, Sandeep, that was a very useful answer. I especially like the bit about the spatial geographies being different. And, and that's also actually um, in, a, in a very different sort of way in India where solar has taken off. And we, do, we are working on solar irrigation. So again, where solar irrigation has taken off are precisely the places where we have a huge groundwater problem. So these kind of paradoxes. So they aren't taking off as much in eastern India as, as we would like to while they are taking off in, in western India for all kinds of reasons. I had two questions and I'm sure our audience have more questions, but um, my first question was, why is Coal India investing in places where the mines aren't located? And my second one was, what role are the discoms playing in this? Uh, what role do they have to play given that they are just buyers of energy? So do they have a more active role in the transition? Uh, so the first question, I'm going to give a very diplomatic answer because <laughs> I have to work with them. Uh, I think I think it's an investment strategy. Uh, it is a fact that these states in Western and Southern India, um, you know, 
that is where renewables have flourished already. Right. Um, so they have clear cut policies. I mean, Jharkhand created its solar policy this year, right? So, and Gujarat has been doing it for like donkey years now. So it's easier. They have clear cut policies. The also uh, the the consumers are there, right? You know, the the load in states like Jharkhand, the consumption is also low. So might as well be close to where the consumption is. So for those reasons, and you know, they are a state owned enterprise, so you can guess why else would they go and invest somewhere else and not mm -hmm. in that regions. Uh, but I think I think it's a push and a pull thing. Uh, that's why they are doing it yeah. in those places. Yeah. Uh, Discom is an interesting question. I think Discom has a big role like with, I don't think, we can meet any of our targets without reforming discoms. Like we have to find a way to make discoms financially stable, right? I mean, they are running in so much losses that they don't pay renewable companies or any company for that matter, right? It's not just renewables, but thermals, thermal power plants have deeper pockets. They have, uh, you know, power purchase agreements, which last for 20, 25, 30 years. So they are a bit more obligated to pay to thermal players. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it comes to renewables, like the challenge is like these are not always long term contracts. And so when they are not paid, it's a big challenge. So I have no I'm not a discom expert, but I think that's a big elephant in the room when it comes to energy transition. Mm -hmm. I am not quite sure how they will fit into this uh, just transition process. Perhaps they have a role, but I don't think either I or others have thought about how that would, uh, how mm. how they would play a role in this. I think the key stakeholders as, as it's visible today are the large industrial players, mining, power, steel, cement, in the long run, um, where right. it will be impacted more and more. Yeah, no, that's, that's fascinating because the work that we are doing in Gujarat is a part of our solar project. We are actually also finding that at the end of the day, a lot of whether whether those systems work well or not is is not really in the hands of the farmers. I mean, even though right. we are training farmers, etc., the the main determinant of how much energy is being produced and how much energy is being evacuated is more or less. Um, kind of related to um, uh, discom proactiveness discom governance you know their um, how how well they are able to liaise with the farmers how well they are able to um, look after so this is a distributed solar that we are right. talking about but yeah. uh, we we are also kind of you know concluding that it's really discoms have a huge role to play um right. i see two more questions one from Mr. Suri Ansari and another from uh, Ishani uh, Palandurkar. Would you like to um, unmute yeah. yourself and ask your questions, please? Um, hi, hi, I'm Suraya. Um, oh, hi, you. sorry. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sandeep, uh, for the uh, lovely discussion. I just wanted to understand more from the uh, point of impact uh, because. Uh, um, ESG is one of the aspects which uh, plays a very important role, and more of the uh, the bigger uh, uh, you know the coal mining uh, industries are also looking to uh, you know uh, to expand their portfolio in the uh, coal uh, I mean in the renewable energy sector as well. So just wanted to understand uh, you know uh, are there any rehabilitation plans by the government or uh, or maybe the academia if they're thinking about about the quantitative uh, estimates or qualitative aspects on you know the environmental economic compensation uh, in terms of rehabilitating the um, industries or the coal mining uh, where, where the coal mining is declining so just wanted to hear your um, uh, understanding on this one yeah yeah thank you no that's a very good question so um, when when it comes to like remediation of the environment, right? You know, because they have acquired that land, then did the mining, etc. And there is a lot of people who have given away their land. When it comes to coal India, in particular, who which I'm more familiar than anything else, um, 
they have a very robust rehabilitation policies when it comes to rehabilitation and and in most cases they provide a job if they take land uh, that's one thing when it comes to remediation after the mining is done when you actually have that land which is completely wrecked you want to you know backfill the mine and, and then use that mine for something else india the coal industry has a policy in fact it's a guideline there was a guideline in 2009 and then a guideline updated guideline in 2019 the challenge with that guideline is that it like many guidelines it's inadequate it's all about planting trees it's not so much about like cleaning up you know the whole ecosystem um, and then restoring it back to its original levels where it's possible it's also not about restoring it and creating local jobs so in a lot of successful case cases around the world what they have done is they have backfilled these mines and then you know you have museums there you have pharma industries there um, so that kind of imaginative future of when you actually backfill these mines and do something else uh, is not there currently the focus is all about planting trees and kind of just doing the basic bare minimum actually government of india ministry of coal their just transition division which is open this year or late last year their whole focus is to think about the rehabilitation of the local ecosystem and ecology what will happen you and i will be there to see but at least there is intent at least they have started to think about that process i don't know if that answered your question but that's that's kind of it does it does thank you so much uh, if uh, if you can point out to any studies uh, or maybe uh, you know the guidelines name then that would be really helpful sure. uh, thank you so much <clears throat> Ishani followed by Urchishman, please. Thank you, Mr. Pai. I just wanted to understand uh, with these transition policies, what's the scope of them? Are they limited to just utilities or would they also give some guidance on how they would be supporting other um, sectors such as agriculture or other sectors which are reliant and directly affected uh, by this transition? so right now in india it's all like i would say 101 stage this i mean these they, the committees have been formed they're just starting to think about what is the scope what should they do etc cetera, etc cetera. it's a long process right this is going to be i would think that some of these committees if they really want to do just transition it's going to be a long scope but if they once they start to th think about that and once they start to formulate just transition diversification in particular like how do you diversify a state like jharkhand how do you diversify some of those districts i think then the scope will be much bigger the scope will include sectors like agriculture and others and i have seen that a lot of people in these mining regions they usually, at least in Jharkhand in particular, um, they are working as coal workers, they are, but they're also agricultural workers. Um, so mm. I think once more evidence is gathered, the scope is well defined, then we'll see whether it's truly limiting to kind of like the coal sector or they're just thinking about others. And, but as a diversification strategy, I think, you know, agriculture although we are, i mean you you are more of an expert on that but some people also suggest agriculture and like you know high yield agriculture as a solution to diversification not just that like you need a cluster of industries not just one industry but agriculture is in the mix in in these discussions in some of these states right got it in Thank yeah, and much. in many of these, these kind of high yielding agriculture would be actually constrained by water. And Jharkhand is very much one of those. So I think there is those those geographies are playing would be quite interesting to see where where those uh, solutions work. And one one more thing, I, I noticed that a lot of these coal states are also very vulnerable to climate change right? yeah. the poor social. So that also adds another yeah. dimension. And I don't know as these committees are formulated and their thinking process evolves, whether they will consider 
some of those issues as well like how it's it's so interesting i mean i don't think it's 100 percent correct but if they take climate action they will suffer if they don't take climate action like they'll suffer due to adaptation so it's i think yeah. that makes it even harder for them absolutely right? yeah yeah no that's a good point uh Urchishwan, did you want to ask your question we are almost at the end of time yeah I just asked very shortly. Hi, Dr. Pai, thanks for your presentation. So my, you talked about that uh, central revenue would be affected uh, based on this transition. So my question was that uh, to what extent state revenues will be affected and is there any planning around redistribution of that revenue? Yeah, the challenges of it. Well, so the figure that everybody quotes and the, based on the analysis is 3% of central government revenue and in the state, I think it ranges. States like Jharkhand have about 10%. There are other states which is five, six percent of, of their revenue. Uh, how that will be managed, I don't think anybody has thought about. I think, like I said, it's very, very early days for this field. Um, we're just even from like scientific or academic studies, we're still not there yet to thinking about how do you redistribute all that and how do you manage the public finance if the decline happens and, and so on and so forth. Uh, a lot of times, I mean, you know, a lot of these stakeholders are not ready to accept that coal is going to go away. Interestingly, nobody is denying that it will go away, but they're not ready to accept that it may go away that soon. Mm -hmm. um, so it's hard to bring in such nuanced conversation yet but like as i said like three years ago not one one bureaucrat or one official knew about this topic the game has really changed with in just a very short amount of time and you know in the next three years perhaps we will be talking about how do you replace revenues and how do you manage this finance bit etc but we're not there yet neither in the neither from an analysis point of view nor from a policy point of view so i don't have any answer basically thank you so much dr sandeep pai that was i thought a fascinating talk and i learned loads because this is also a topic that is not something that i directly work on but this is of a huge interest to all of us who are trying to understand what exactly is just energy transition and from our side, one of our research interests is also to see how water links in this just energy transition story. So some of the work that we are doing in terms of the distributed solar in Gujarat is where I think the water story comes in. So we would be in touch with you and try to learn a bit more uh, if, if we are positioning our research uh, in, in ways that's, that make sense. With that, I want to thank all of you who have joined us today. Um, thank you so much for joining us and thank you so much, Dr. Pai, for this fascinating talk. We again have our next seminar that is number four in the series, which will be on 21st of November, same time. It will be by Dr. Shamir Shah, who will be talking about geographies of maladaptation, Jaluk Shivar Abhiyan, and the reproduction of water securities in drought prone Maharashtra. We hope to see you all uh, in a month's time. So thank you so much. And we'll have this posted thank on you. our, yeah. Thank, thank you, you, Aditi. And thank you to your team. Um, it was really delightful. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.